Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Charles. And before I get into today's video, I have an important question I'm gonna ask you. What does having home backup power have anything to do with the coronavirus? Uh-oh. Whose house are you gonna stay in if the power goes out? Hello? Anyone there? Hello? Oh man, this sucks. California is now in what's called the fire season, which typically runs from May to October. That is when the state's vegetation dries up and becomes fuel for fires. It is made worse during the months of fall when winds really start to pick up. Because of climate change, California has experienced years of little precipitation, making lands extremely dry and making for the potential of fires to start up at any time of the year. This year's fire season was made especially worse with the lightning strikes that California endured in August, sparking what's been called the LNU, CZU, and SCU lightning complex fires which have burned a total of nearly 846,400 acres at the time of recording this video. Since the beginning of 2020, California has had a total of over 8,300 wildfire incidents with a grand total of over 4 million acres burned. Because of the dangers of wildfires erupting during fire season, California has instituted public safety power shutoffs, or PSPS, up and down the state by power companies such as PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric in a preemptive attempt to mitigate wildfires from occurring as a result from damage to transmission lines and other equipment due to falling trees, taking down energized lines, and setting off fires. PSPSs in California have been around for many years, but haven't received national attention until recently when in 2019 the PSPS affected the lives and businesses of millions of customers in parts of over 30 counties shutting out power to them for several days at a time. It's been reported that the PSPS of 2019 is to blame for at least one death. Other impacts were the loss of food that had to be thrown out and the loss of inventory and revenue from businesses having to shut down. PG&E has already started their PSPS for this year and is trying to minimize the number of people impacted and the number of days without power. Of course, PSPSs aren't the only times when you may need backup power for your home. Power outages can happen during severe weather storms where lightning strikes and high winds can knock down trees and power lines. PSPSs can also occur when the power grid is in overuse during those hot summer months when homes and businesses are using the air conditioning systems. And in the rare occasion there is a malfunction to the electrical system upstream from your home or city. Though power outages for the most part are usually rare, having one is more of an inconvenience than anything else. During this pandemic, and with the cases of the coronavirus still on the rise, people can't afford to have their power shut down for days at a time and risk getting infected or infecting others if they stay at a friend's or family member's home who does have power. You can always stay at home and use flashlights and candles just to get by. But if you don't want to risk your fridge and freezer full of food to go bad or want to still be able to enjoy the necessities at home brought to you by electricity during the power outage, then getting some kind of home backup power in times like these would be the best thing for you to do. When it comes to home backup power, there are several options you can choose from. The first option is a standby generator like the Generac. It is installed outside the home and it is tied to the home's electrical system via a transfer switch. It kicks in automatically when it senses a power outage and goes back to standby mode when the power from the grid comes back on. It operates on liquid propane or it can be tied directly to your home's natural gas line and it can power everything in the home. Only one of these isn't cheap. A decent sized one having a capacity of 12 kilowatts to 44 kilowatts can cost anywhere from $4,000 to $15,000, complete with installation. Batteries and solar panels are two options that go hand in hand. Batteries such as the Powerwall from Tesla is another option for home backup power. The power wall is connected to the grid to charge its batteries. Or, if you have solar panels installed on your roof, the power wall gets its charge from the panels. During the day, solar panels power your house. If the panels are generating more power than what your house needs at that time, the panels will charge the batteries. If the panels cannot generate enough power for your house, then it taps into the grid for additional power. At night, or when the solar panels are no longer generating power, the fully charged batteries will then take over and power your house. The process will then repeat itself the following day. The initial investment for a battery backup and or solar panel system is not cheap. 
According to EnergySage.com, the price of just the power wall, including installation, roughly costs anywhere between $9,600 to $15,600. Adding in solar panels, that cost will be roughly another $9,000 to $15,000 for a 5 kilowatt solar panel system. Of course, cost for parts and installation depend on where you live and the sizing for your home's power needs. You'll need to weigh the cost of owning such a system and any potential savings you may get before making your purchase. We live in California, but not in rural areas, so power outages are very rare. We did, however, last year experience a PSPS around October that lasted a few days, in which we ended up staying with family those few days. But even during severe weather, rarely does the power go out. We don't have anything in our home that would be catastrophic if the power goes out. So for us, owning something like a standby generator or a battery solar panel system would just be cost prohibitive. We would not be able to justify the cost of owning such a system. So instead, we're looking at option number three, like the portable generator shown here. There are two basic types of portable generators. The first type simply called a generator and the second type called an inverter. They both run on either gasoline, diesel, and propane needed to fuel the engine inside both types. The rotating engine converts mechanical power into alternating current, or AC, which is then used to power lights, TVs, and refrigerators. The engine in a regular portable generator runs at a constant speed, so whether you are running one to power lights or to power a refrigerator, or both, the output power is the same. This tends to make this type of portable generator run loud since the demand for power needs to be readily available no matter what needs to be powered. The engine in an inverter, on the other hand, will speed up if the demand for power increases and will slow down if the demand is less. This results in a much quieter and more fuel efficient generator. When it comes to the quality of power, the inverter does a much better job at supplying constant and clean power, which is especially needed for computers and other types of sensitive electronics. When it comes to cost, it will cost you anywhere from $400 to $1,000 to purchase a standard portable generator according to consumerreports.org and anywhere from $500 to $4,000 for an inverter. Both types come in different power sizing needs, such as the 2200 watt portable inverter from Honda, the 3000 watt portable inverter from Generac, and the 7000 watt portable generator from Dewalt. Before purchasing a portable generator, you first need to consider what types of appliances you will be running in order to correctly pick one for your power sizing needs. For example, if you only needed to run a refrigerator and some lights, your power sizing needs will be much smaller compared to someone who needs to power those same appliances plus a TV and a microwave. You also need to consider the startup power needs for those appliances when sizing an appropriate portable generator. For instance, a refrigerator may run on only 900 watts but may require 2,700 watts just to turn it on. So in this example, a portable generator that supplies 2,200 watts will not work. For help in your power sizing needs, I'll leave a link in the description below to help you out with that. Disaster preparedness is very important. You don't want to be stuck along with everyone else running around looking for things you need when disaster strikes. A little preparation and planning will go a long way.